Chapter 10 Crossroads I'm the fellow who takes away the punch bowl just when the party is getting good. William McChesney Martin, Jr., Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, 1951 to 1970. The trouble is that this is no ordinary recession, and a lot of people have not had any punch yet. Kenneth Rogoff, June 6, 2013. Developed countries have no reason to default. They can always print money. George Soros, April 9, 2013. The Inflation-Deflation Paradox Federal Reserve policy is at a crossroads facing unpleasant paths in all directions. Monetary policy around the world has reached the point where the contradictions embedded in years of market manipulation have left no choices that do not involve either contraction or catastrophic risk. Further monetary easing may precipitate a loss of confidence in money. Policy tightening will restart the collapse in asset values that began in 2007. Only structural change in the U.S. economy, something outside the Fed's purview, can break this stalemate. This much was clear by 2013, as weary economists and policymakers waited for the robust recovery they had eagerly anticipated since the stock market rally started in 2009. Annual GDP growth in the United States touched 4% in the fourth quarter of 2009, prompting talk of green shoots amid signs that the economy was bouncing back from the worst recession since the Great Depression. Even when growth fell to a 2.2% annual rate by the second quarter of 2010, the optimistic spin continued, with happy talk by Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner of a recovery summer by 2010. Reality slowly sank in. Annual growth was an anemic 1.8% in 2011 and was only slightly better at 2.2% in 2012. Then, despite predictions from the Fed and private analysts that 2013 would be a turnaround year, growth fell again to 1.1% in the first quarter of 2013, although it revived by 4.1% in the third quarter. The economy was in a phase not seen in 80 years. It was neither a recession, as technically defined, nor a robust recovery, as widely expected. It was a depression, exactly as Keynes had defined it. A chronic condition of subnormal activity for a considerable period without any marked tendency either towards recovery or towards complete collapse. There was no cyclical recovery because the problems in the economy were not cyclical. They were structural. This depression should be expected to continue indefinitely in the absence of structural changes. Fed forecasters and most private analysts use models based on credit and business cycles from the 70-odd years since the end of the Second World War. Those baselines do not include any depressions. One must reach back 80 years to the 1933 to 1936 period, a recovery within a depression, to find a comparable phase. The Great Depression ended in 1940 with structural changes. The economy was put on a war footing. In early 2014, no war was imminent, and no structural changes were being contemplated. Instead, depressionary low growth and high unemployment have become normal in the U.S. economy. The American Enterprise Institute's John Macon, who has an uncanny record of accurately predicting economic cycles, pointed out that based on historical patterns, the United States might actually be headed for a recession in 2014, the second recession within a depression since 2007, an eerie replay of the Great Depression. Macon pointed out that despite below-trend growth since 2009, The expansion has lasted over four years and is approaching the average longevity for modern economic expansions in the United States. Based on duration, if not strength, U.S. real growth should be expected to turn negative in the near future. Even if the United States does not enter a technical recession in 2014, the Depression will continue, the strongest evidence coming from Depression-level employment data 
Despite cheerleading in late 2013 about the creation of 200,000 new jobs per month and a declining unemployment rate, the reality behind the headline data is grim. As analyst Dan Alpert points out, almost 60% of jobs created in the first half of 2013 were in the lowest wage sectors of the U.S. economy. These sectors normally account for one-third of total jobs, meaning that new job creation was disproportionately low wage by a factor of almost two to one. Low-wage jobs are positions such as the order taker at McDonald's, the bartender at Applebee's, and the checkout clerk at Walmart. All work has dignity, but not all work has pay that can ignite a self-sustaining economic recovery. About 50% of the jobs created during the first half of 2013 were part-time, defined as jobs with 35 hours of work per week or less. Some part-time jobs offer as little as one hour per week. If the unemployment rate were calculated by counting those working part-time who want full-time work and those who want a job but have given up looking, the unemployment rate in mid-2013 would be 14.3%, instead of the officially reported 7.1%. The 14.3% figure is comparable to levels reached during the Great Depression, a level consistent with an economic depression. New hiring since 2009 has been roughly equal to the number of new entrants into the workforce at that time period, which means that it did nothing to reduce the total number of those who became unemployed during the acute phase of the panic and downturn in 2008 and 2009. Alpert also shows that even the supposed good news of a declining unemployment rate is misleading, because the declining rate reflects those workers dropping out of the workforce entirely, then new job creation in an expanding labor pool. The percentage of Americans counted in the labor force had dropped from a high of 66.1% before the New Depression to 63.5% by mid-2013. Even with the reduced labor force, real wage gains adjusted for inflation were not being realized, and in fact real wages have been falling for the past 15 years. Added to this dismal employment picture is the striking increase in dependency on government programs. By late 2013, the United States had over 50 million citizens on food stamps, over 26 million citizens unemployed, underemployed, or discouraged from looking for work and over 11 million citizens on permanent disability, many of those because their unemployment benefits had run out. These numbers are a national disgrace. Combined with feeble growth, borderline recession conditions, and over five years of zero interest rates, these figures made talk of an economic recovery seem misplaced. Though overall conditions suggest a new depression, one element was missing from the portrait namely, deflation, defined as a generalized drop in consumer prices and asset values. During the darkest stage of the Great Depression, from 1930 to 1933, cumulative deflation in the United States was 26%, part of a broader worldwide deflationary collapse. The United States experienced slight deflation around 2009 compared to 2008, but nothing at all comparable to the Great Depression. In fact, mild inflation has persisted in the new depression, and the official consumer price index shows a 10.6% increase from the beginning of 2008 to mid-2013. The contrast between the extreme deflation of the Great Depression and the mild inflation of the new depression is the most obvious difference between the two episodes, and is also the source of the greatest challenge now facing the Federal Reserve. It raises the vexing question of when and how to reduce and eventually reverse money printing. A depression's natural state is deflation. Businesses faced with declining revenue and individuals faced with unemployment will rapidly sell assets to reduce debt, a process known as deleveraging. As asset sales continue and as spending declines, Prices decline further, which is deflation's immediate cause. Those price declines then add further economic stress, leading to additional asset sales, 
more unemployment, and so on in a feedback loop. In deflation, the real value of cash increases, so individuals and businesses hoard cash instead of spending it or investing it in new land, plant, and equipment. This entire process of asset sales, hoarding, and price declines is called a liquidity trap, famously described by Irving Fisher in his 1933 work The Debt Deflation Theory of Great Depressions, and by John Maynard Keynes in his most influential work The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. In a liquidity trap, the response to money printing is generally weak, and from a Keynesian perspective, fiscal policy is the preferred medicine. While the response to money printing may be weak, it is not nil. Working against potential deflation has been a massive money printing operation by the Federal Reserve. In the six years from 2008 to 2014, the Federal Reserve has increased money base from about $800 billion to over $4 trillion, a more than 400% increase. While the turnover or velocity of money has been in sharp decline, the quantity of money has skyrocketed, helping to offset the slower pace of spending. The combination of massive money printing and zero interest rates has also propped up asset prices, leading to a stock market rally and a strong recovery in housing prices since 2009. But asset values are being inflated from other sources, too. Tuition tally Another reason deflation has not prevailed over inflation, despite faint economic growth, is that the U.S. Treasury has promoted a new cash injection into the economy, larger than subprime housing finance in the 2002-2007 period. This injection is in the form of student loans. Student loans are the new subprime mortgages, another government-subsidized bubble about to burst. Students have a high propensity to spend, whether on tuition itself or on books, apartments, furniture, and beer. If you give students money, they will spend it. There is little danger that they will buy gold or otherwise hoard the money as savings. Tuition payments financed by student loans are a mere conduit, since the payments are passed along as union faculty salaries or university overhead. Loan proceeds remaining after tuition are spent directly by the students. Annual borrowing in all undergraduate and graduate student loan programs surged to over $100 billion per year in 2012, up from about $65 billion per year at the start of the 2007 Depression. By August 2013, total student loans backed by the U.S. government exceeded $1 trillion, an amount that has doubled since 2009. A provision contained in the 2010 Obamacare legislation provided the U.S. Treasury with a near monopoly on student loan origination and sidelined most private lenders who formerly participated in this market. This meant that the Treasury could relax lending standards to continue the flow of easy money. The student loan market is politically untouchable because higher education historically produces citizens with added skills who repay the loans and earn higher incomes over time. No member of Congress wants to support legislation that would crimp Johnny or Susie's ability to afford college. But the program has morphed into direct government pump priming in the same manner that historically productive home lending programs morphed into a housing bubble between 1994 and 2007. In the mortgage market, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac used government subsidies to push home ownership beyond levels that buyers could afford giving rise to subprime mortgages without documentation or down payments. The mortgage market crashed in 2007, marking the start of the Depression. Student loans now pose a similar dynamic. Most of the loans are sound and will be repaid as agreed, but many borrowers will default because the students did not acquire needed skills and cannot find jobs in a listless economy. Those defaults will make federal budget deficits worse, a development not fully reflected in official budget projections. In effect, student loans are being pumped out by the U.S. Treasury and directed to borrowers with a high propensity to spend and limited ability to repay. <laughs>
These monies have helped prop up the U.S. economy, but the flow of tuition dollars isn't sustainable. It is economically no different than the Chinese building ghost cities with borrowed money that cannot be repaid. Chinese ghost cities and U.S. diplomas are real. But productivity increases and the ability to repay the borrowings are not. While student loans may provide a short-term lift to discretionary spending, the long-term effects of excessive debt combined with the absence of jobs are another encumbrance on the economy. A record 21 million young adults between ages 18 and 31 are living with their parents. Many of these stay-at-homes are recent graduates who cannot pay rent or afford down payments on homes because of student loans. For now, student loan cash flows and spending have helped to defer the deflation threat. But the student loan bubble will burst in the years ahead, making the debt and deficit crises worse. The Inflation Conundrum Former Fed Chairman Bernanke once said that the Federal Reserve could combat deflation by throwing money from helicopters. His metaphor assumed that people would gladly pick up the money and spend it. In the real world, however, picking up the money means going into debt in the form of business loans, mortgages, and credit cards. Businesses and individuals are unwilling to go into debt because of policy uncertainty and the threat of even more deflation. Going back to 2009, Bernanke's critics have claimed that quantitative easing would lead to unacceptably high inflation, even imminent hyperinflation. These critics focused exclusively on money printing, failing to perceive that inflation is only partially a function of money supply. The other key factor is behavior in the form of lending and spending. Underlying weakness in the economy and extreme uncertainty about policies on taxes health care, environmental regulation, and other business cost determinants resulted in stagnation both in consumer spending and in business investment, two main drivers of economic growth. A standoff in the battle between deflation and inflation does not mean that price stability prevails. The opposing forces may have neutralized each other for the time being, but neither has gone away. Collapsing growth in China and a re-emergence of the sovereign debt crisis in Europe could give deflation the upper hand. Conversely, a war in the Middle East, followed by a commodity price shock, surging oil prices, and panicked gold buying, could cause dollar dumping and an inflationary groundswell that the Fed would be unable to contain. Either extreme is possible. This dilemma is reflected by a difference of opinion at the Federal Open Market Committee, or FOMC the Fed's policymaking arm, between those who favor reduced money printing and those who favor a continuation or even expansion of the money supply through Fed asset purchases. The group that favors reduced money printing, so-called tapering, led by Fed Governor Jeremy Stein, contends that continued money printing is having only limited positive effects and may create asset bubbles and systemic risk. Since money is practically free because of zero-rate policy, and since leverage magnifies returns to investors, the inducement to borrow money and take a chance on rising asset prices is hard to resist. Leverage is available to stock traders in the form of margin loans and to home buyers in the form of cheap mortgages. Since rising stock and home prices are based on cheap money rather than economic fundamentals, both markets are forming new bubbles which will eventually burst and damage confidence again. Under certain scenarios, the outcome could be worse than a bursting bubble and might include systemic risk and outright panic. The stock market is poised for a crash worse than 2000 or 2008. Business television anchors and sell-side analysts are only too happy to announce each new high on the stock market indexes. In fact, these highs are mostly nominal. They are not entirely real. When the reported index levels are adjusted for inflation, a different picture emerges. The 2008 peak was actually below the 2000 peak in real terms. The nominal peak in 1973 was followed in 1974 by one of the worst stock market crashes in U.S. history. Past is not necessarily prelude. 
Still, the combination of extreme leverage, economic weakness, and a looming recession all put the stock market at risk of an historic crash. Any such crash would result in a blow to confidence that no amount of Fed money printing could assuage. It would trigger an extreme version of Fisher's debt deflation cycle. In this scenario, deflation would finally gain the upper hand over inflation, and the economic dynamics of the early 1930s would return with a vengeance. Another factor that could contribute to a worst-case result is the hidden leverage on bank balance sheets in the form of derivatives and asset swaps. The concern here relates not to a stock market crash, but to a counterparty failure that triggers a liquidity crisis in financial markets and precipitates a panic. The pro-tapering group around Fed Governor Stein understands that reduced money printing may hurt growth, but they fear that a stock market crash or a financial panic would hurt growth much more by destroying confidence. In their view, reduced money printing now is a way to let a little air out of the bubbles without deflating them entirely. In opposition to this view are FOMC members like Fed Chairwoman Janet Yellen who see no immediate inflation risk due to excess capacity in labor markets and manufacturing, and who favor continued large asset purchases and money printing as the only hope for continued growth, especially in light of the recent tightening in fiscal policy. For Yellen, the money printing should continue until persistent inflation above 2.5% actually emerges and until unemployment is 6.5% or less. Yellen favors continued money printing even if inflation rises to 3% or more, so long as unemployment is above 6.5%. She regards the risks of financial panic as remote, and is confident that inflation can be controlled in due course with available tools if inflation does not rise too far. Yellen's confidence in the remoteness of inflation and in the Fed's ability to control inflation, if it does emerge, is based on her application of conventional general equilibrium models that do not include the most advanced theoretical work on complexity theory, interconnectedness, and the sudden emergence of systemic risk. On the other hand, her understanding that inflation was not imminent due to slack in labor and industrial capacity made her economic forecasts consistently more accurate than those of her colleagues and the Fed staff from 2011 to 2013. These forecasting successes added to her credibility inside the Federal Reserve and were important in her selection as the new Fed chairwoman. As a result, her views on the need for continued money printing carry great weight with the Fed staff and the FOMC. It is not surprising that the FOMC members are deeply divided between the contrasting views espoused by Stein and Yellen. Stein is no doubt correct that systemic risk is building up unseen in the banking system through off-balance sheet transactions, and that new bubbles are emerging. Yellen is undoubtedly right that the economy is fundamentally weak and needs all the policy support it can get to avoid outright recession and deflation. The fact that both sides in the debate are correct means both sides are also incorrect, to the extent that they fail to incorporate their opponents' valid points in their own views. The resulting policy incoherence is the inevitable outcome of the Fed's market manipulation. Valid price signals are suppressed or distorted, which induces banks to take risky positions that serve no business purpose except to eke out profits in a zero-rate environment. At the same time, asset values are inflated, which means that capital is not devoted to its most productive uses, but instead chases evanescent mark-to-market gains in stocks and housing. Both continued money printing and the reduction of money printing pose risks, albeit different kinds. The result is a standoff between natural deflation and policy-induced inflation. The economy is like a high-altitude climber proceeding slowly, methodically on a ridgeline at 28,000 feet without oxygen. On one side of the ridge is a vertical face that goes straight down for a mile. On the other side is a steep glacier that offers no way to secure a grip. A fall to either side means certain death. Yet, moving ahead gets more difficult with every step and makes a fall more likely. Turning back is an option, 
so that means finally facing the pain that the economy avoided in 2009 when the money-printing journey began. The great American novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote in 1936 that the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. By 2014, the Federal Reserve Board members were being put to Fitzgerald's test. Inflation and deflation are opposed ideas, as are tapering and non-tapering. No doubt the Fed board members start with first-rate intelligence. They are now confronted with opposing ideas. The question is whether, as Fitzgerald phrased it, they can still retain the ability to function. Confidence Former Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker joined the Fed as a staff economist in 1952 and has witnessed or led every significant monetary and financial development since. As the Treasury Undersecretary, he was at President Nixon's side when the dollar's convertibility into gold was ended in 1971. Appointed Fed Chairman by President Carter in 1979, he raised interest rates to 19% in 1981 to break the back of the borderline hyperinflation that gripped America from 1977 onward. In 2009, President Obama selected him to head the Economic Recovery Advisory Board to formulate responses to the worst economic slump since the Great Depression. From this platform, he advanced the Volcker Rule, an attempt to restore sound banking practices that were abandoned with the repeal of Glass-Steagall in 1999. The Volcker Rule finally got past the big bank lobbyists in 2013. Volcker correctly perceived the riskiest facet of the banking system and deserves much credit for working to fix it. No banker or policymaker knows more about money and how it works than Volcker. When pressed about the dollar's role in the international monetary system today, Volcker acknowledges the challenges facing the U.S. economy, and the dollar in particular, with a kind of been-there-done-that attitude. He points out that circumstances are not as dire as they were in 1971 when there was a run on Fort Knox, or in 1978 when, because international creditors had begun to reject the U.S. dollar as a store of value, the U.S. Treasury issued the infamous Carter Bonds, denominated in Swiss francs. When pressed harder, Volcker is candid about China's rise and acknowledges talk of the dollar being knocked off its pedestal as the world's leading reserve currency. But he just as quickly points out that despite the talk, no currency comes close to the dollar in terms of the deep, liquid pools of investable assets needed for true reserve currency status. Volcker is no fan of the gold standard and believes a return to gold is neither feasible nor desirable. Finally, when presented with issues such as bonded debt, massive entitlements, continuing deficits, and legislative dysfunction that suggests the dollar denouement has already begun, Volcker narrows his gaze, hardens his demeanor, and utters one word, confidence. He believes that if people have confidence in it, the dollar can weather any storm. If people lose confidence in the dollar, no army of PhDs can save it. On this point, Volcker is certainly right, yet no one can say whether confidence in the dollar has past the point of no return due to Fed blunders, debt ceiling debacles, and the precautions of the Russians and Chinese. Unfortunately, there are growing signs that confidence in the dollar is evaporating. In October 2013, the Fed's Price-Adjusted Broad Dollar Index, the best gauge of the dollar standing in foreign exchange markets, stood at 84.05, an improvement on the all-time low of 80.52 of July 2011, but approximately equal to prior lows in October 1979, July 1995, and April 2008. Demands for physical gold bullion, a measure of lost confidence in the dollar, began rising sharply in mid to late 2013, another sign of a weak dollar. The foreign currency composition of global reserves, shows a continuing decline in the dollar's use as a reserve currency from about 70% in 2000 to about 60% today. 
No one of these readings indicates an immediate crisis, but all three show declining confidence. Other indications are anecdotal and difficult to quantify, but are no less telling. Among them are the rise of alternative currencies and of virtual or digital currencies, such as Bitcoin. Digital currencies exist within private peer-to-peer -peer computer networks and are not issued by or supported by any government or central bank. The Bitcoin phenomenon began in 2008 with the pseudonymous publication of a paper by Satoshi Nakamoto describing the protocols for the creation of a new electronic digital currency. In January 2009, the first Bitcoins were created by Nakamoto's software. He continued making technical contributions to the Bitcoin project until 2010, at which point he withdrew from active participation. However, by that time, a large community of developers, libertarians, and entrepreneurs had taken up the project. By late 2013, over 11.5 million Bitcoins were in circulation, with the number growing steadily. The value of each Bitcoin fluctuates based on supply and demand, but it had exceeded $700 per Bitcoin in November 2013. Bitcoin's long-term viability as a virtual currency remains to be seen, but its rapid and widespread adoption can already be taken as a sign that communities around the world are seeking alternatives to the dollar and traditional fiat currencies. Beyond the world of alternative currencies lies the world of transactions without currencies at all. The Electronic Barter Market Barter is one of the most misunderstood of economic concepts. A large economic literature is devoted to the inefficiencies of barter, which requires the simultaneous coincidence of wants between the two bartering parties. If one party wanted to trade wheat for nails, and the counterparty wanted wheat but had only rope to trade, the first party might accept the rope and go in search of someone with nails who wanted rope. In this telling, money was an efficient medium of exchange that solved the simultaneity problem because one could sell her wheat for money and then use the money to buy nails without having to barter the rope. But as author David Graeber points out, the history of barter is mostly a myth. Economists since Adam Smith have assumed that barter was the historical predecessor of money, but there is no empirical, archaeological, or other evidence for the existence of of a widespread pre-money barter economy. In fact, it appears that pre-money economies were based largely on credit, the promise to return value in the future in exchange for value delivered today. The ancient credit system allowed intertemporal exchanges as it does today and solved the problem of the simultaneous coincidence of wants. Historical barter is one more example of economists developing theories with scant attachment to reality. Mythical history notwithstanding, barter is a rapidly growing form of economic exchange today because networked computers solve the simultaneity problem. One recent example involved the China Railway Corporation, General Electric, and Tyson Foods. China Railway had a customer a poultry processor, that filed for bankruptcy, resulting in the railroad taking possession of frozen turkeys pledged as collateral. General Electric was selling gas turbine electric locomotives to the railroad, and China Railway inquired if it could pay for the locomotives with the uh, frozen turkeys. GE, which has an 18-person e-barter trading desk, quickly ascertained that Tyson Foods, China, would take delivery of the turkeys for cash. China Railway delivered the turkeys to Tyson Foods, which paid cash to GE, and then GE delivered the locomotives to China Railway. The transaction between GE and China Railway was effectively the barter of turkeys for turbines, with no money changing hands. Cashless barter may not have been part of the past, but it will increasingly be part of the future. The Bitcoin and barter examples both illustrate that the dollar grows less essential every day. This is also seen in the rise of regional trade currency blocks, such as Northeast Asia and the China-South America connection. Three-way trade among China, Japan, and Korea, and the bilateral trade between China and its respective trading partners in South America, are among the largest and fastest-growing trading relationships in the world.
None of these currencies involved, yuan, yen, won, rial, or peso, are close to becoming reserve currencies. But all serve perfectly well as trade currencies for transactions that would previously have been invoiced in dollars. Trade currencies are used as a temporary way to keep score in the balance of trade, while reserve currencies come with deep pools of investable assets used to store wealth. Even if these local currencies are used for trade and not as reserves, each transaction represents a diminution in the role of the dollar. To paraphrase Hemingway, confidence in the dollar is lost slowly at first, then quickly. Virtual currencies, new trade currencies, and the absence of currency, in the case of barter, are all symptoms of the slow, gradual loss of confidence in the dollar. They are the symptoms, but not the cause. The causes of declining confidence in the dollar are the dual specter of inflation and deflation. The perception on the part of many that the dollar is no longer a store of value, but a lottery ticket, potentially worth far more or far less than face value for reasons beyond the holder's control. Panic gold buying and the emergency issuance of SDRs to restore liquidity when it comes will signal the stage of a rapid loss of confidence. Volcker was right in his assertion that confidence is indispensable to the stability of any fiat currency system. Unfortunately, the academics who are now responsible for monetary policy focus exclusively on equilibrium models and take confidence too much for granted. Failure of Imagination Following the 9-11 attacks in New York and Washington, D.C., the U.S. intelligence community was reproached for its failure to detect and prevent the hijacking plots. These criticisms reached a crescendo when it was revealed that the CIA and the FBI had specific intelligence linking terrorists and flying lessons, but failed to share the information or connect the dots. The New York Times columnist, Tom Friedman, offered the best description of what went wrong. September 11 was not a failure of intelligence or coordination. It was a failure of imagination. Friedman's point was that even if all the facts had been known and shared by the various intelligence agencies, they still would have missed the plot because it was too unusual and too evil to fit analysts' preconceived notions of terrorist capabilities. A similar challenge confronts U.S. economic policymakers today. Data on economic performance, unemployment, and the buildup of derivatives inside megabanks are readily available. Conventional economic models abound, and the analysts supplying those models are among the best and brightest in their field. There is no lack of information and no shortage of intelligence. The missing piece is imagination. Fed and Wall Street analysts, tied to the use of models based on past business cycles, seem incapable of imagining the dangers actually confronting the U.S. economy. The 9-11 attacks demonstrated that the failure to imagine the worst often results in a failure to prevent it. The worst economic danger confronting the United States is deceptively simple. It looks like this. Negative 1 minus negative 3 equals 2. In this equation, the first term represents nominal growth. The second term represents inflation or deflation. And the right side of the equation equals real growth. A more familiar presentation of this equation is 5 minus 2 equals 3. In this familiar form, the equation says that we begin with 5% nominal growth, then subtract 2% inflation in order to reach 3% real growth. Nominal growth is the gross value of goods and services produced in the economy, and inflation is a change in the price level that does not represent real growth. To arrive at real growth, one subtracts inflation from the nominal value. This same inflation adjustment can be applied to asset values, interest rates, and many other data points. One must subtract inflation from the stated or nominal value in order to get the real value. 
When inflation turns to deflation, the price adjustment becomes a negative value rather than a positive one because prices decline in a deflationary environment. The expression negative 1 minus negative 3 equals 2 describes nominal growth of negative 1% minus a price change of negative 3%, producing positive 2% real growth. In effect, the impact of declining prices more than offsets declining nominal growth and therefore produces real growth. This condition has almost never been seen in the United States since the late 19th century. But it is neither rare elsewhere nor impossible in the United States. In fact, it has been Japan's condition for parts of the past 25 years. The first thing to notice about this equation is that there is real growth of 2%, which is weak by historic standards, but roughly equal to U.S. growth since 2009. As an alternative scenario using the formula I just outlined, assume annual deflation of 4%, as actually occurred from 1931 to 1933. Now the expression is negative 1 minus negative 4 equals 3. In this case, real growth would be 3%, much closer to trend and arguably not at depressionary levels. However, a condition of high deflation, zero interest rates, and continuing high unemployment closely resembles a depression. This is an example of the through-the-looking-glass quality of economic analysis in a world of deflation. Despite possible real growth, the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve fear deflation more than any other economic outcome. Deflation means a persistent decline in price levels for goods and services. Lower prices allow for higher living standards even when wages are constant because consumer goods cost less. This would seem to be a desirable outcome based on advances in technology and productivity that result in certain products dropping in price over time, such as computers and mobile phones. Why is the Federal Reserve so fearful of deflation that it resorts to extraordinary policy measures designed to cause inflation? There are four reasons for this fear. The first is deflation's impact on government debt repayment. Debt's real value may fluctuate based on inflation or deflation, but the nominal value of a debt is fixed by contract. If one borrows $1 million, then one must repay $1 million plus interest, regardless of whether the real value of $1 million is greater or less due to deflation or inflation. U.S. debt is at a point where no feasible combination of real growth and taxes will finance repayment of the amount owed. But if the Fed can cause inflation, slowly at first, to create money illusion, and then more rapidly, the debt will be manageable because it will be repaid in less valuable nominal dollars. In deflation, the opposite occurs. The real value of the debt increases, making repayment more difficult. The second problem with deflation is its impact on the debt-to-GDP ratio. This ratio is the debt amount divided by the GDP amount, both expressed in nominal terms. Debt is continually increasing in nominal terms because of continuing budget deficits that require new financing and interest payments that are financed with new debt. However, as shown in the previous example, real growth can be positive even if nominal GDP is shrinking, provided deflation exceeds nominal growth. In the debt-to-GDP ratio, when the debt numerator expands and the GDP denominator shrinks, the ratio increases. Even without calculating entitlements, the U.S. debt-to-GDP ratio is already at its highest level since the Second World War. Including entitlements makes the situation far worse. Over time, the impact of deflation could drive the U.S. debt-to-GDP ratio above the level of Greece, closer to that of Japan. Indeed, this deflationary dynamic is one reason the Japanese debt-to-GDP ratio currently exceeds 220%, by far the highest of any developed economy.
One impact of such sky-high debt-to-GDP ratios on foreign creditors is ultimately a loss of confidence. Higher interest rates, worse deficits because of the higher interest rates, and finally, an outright default on the debt. The third deflation concern has to do with the health of the banking system and systemic risk. Deflation increases money's real value and therefore increases the real value of lenders' claims on debtors. This would seem to favor lenders over debtors, and initially it does. But as deflation progresses, the real weight of the debt becomes too great, and debtor defaults surge. This puts the losses back on the bank lenders and causes bank insolvencies. Thus, the government prefers inflation, since it props up the banking system by keeping banks and debtors solvent. The fourth and final problem with deflation is its impact on tax collection. This problem is illustrated by comparing a worker making $100,000 per year in two different scenarios. In the first scenario, prices are constant and the worker receives a $5,000 raise. In the second scenario, prices drop 5% and the worker receives no raise. On a pre-tax basis, the worker has the same 5% increase in her standard of living in both scenarios. In the first scenario, the improvement comes from a higher wage, and in the second, it comes from lower prices, but the economic result is the same. Yet, on an after-tax basis, these scenarios produce entirely different outcomes. The government taxes the raise, say, at a 40% rate, but the government cannot tax the declining prices. In the first scenario, the worker keeps only 60% of the raise after taxes, but in the second scenario, she keeps 100% of the benefit of lower prices. If one assumes inflation is the first example, the worker may be even worse off because the part of the raise remaining after taxes is diminished by inflation, and the government is better off because it collects more taxes and the real value of government debt declines. Since inflation favors the government and deflation favors the worker, governments always favor inflation. In summary, the Federal Reserve prefers inflation because it erases government debt, reduces the debt-to-GDP ratio, props up the banks, and can be taxed. Deflation may help consumers and workers, but it hurts the Treasury and the banks and is firmly opposed by the Fed. This explains Alan Greenspan's extraordinary low interest rate policies in 2002 and Ben Bernanke's zero rate policy beginning in 2008. From the Fed's perspective, aiding the economy and reducing unemployment are incidental byproducts of the drive to inflate. The consequence of these deflationary dynamics is that the government must have inflation, and the Fed must cause it. The dynamics amount to an historic collision between the natural forces of deflation and government's need for inflation. So long as price index data show that deflation is a threat, the Fed will continue with its zero-rate policy, money printing, and efforts to cheapen the dollar in foreign exchange markets in order to import inflation through higher import prices. When the data show a trend toward inflation, the Fed will allow the trend to continue in the hope that nominal growth will become self-sustaining. This will cause inflation to take on a life of its own through behavioral feedback loops not included in Fed models. Japan is a large canary in a coal mine in this regard. The Asian nation has undergone persistent core deflation since 1999, but also saw positive real growth from 2003 to 2007 and negative nominal growth in 2001 and 2002. Japan has not experienced the precise combination of negative nominal growth deflation, and positive real growth on a persistent basis, but it has flirted with all those elements throughout the past 15 years. To break out of this coil, Japan's new prime minister, Shinzo Abe, elected in December 2012, declared his policy of the three arrows, money printing to cause inflation, deficit spending, and structural reforms. A corollary to this policy was to weaken the exchange value of the yen 
to import inflation, mostly through higher prices for energy imports. The initial response to Abenomics was highly favorable. In the five months following Abe's election, the yen, measured against dollars, dropped 17 percent, from 85 to 1 to 102 to 1, while the Japanese Nikkei stock index rose 50 percent. The combination of cheaper yen, the wealth effect from rising stock prices, and the promise of more money printing and deficit spending seemed like a page from a central banker's playbook on how to break out of a deflationary spiral. Despite the burst of market enthusiasm for Abenomics, a cautionary note was raised in a speech on May 31, 2013, in Seoul, South Korea, by one of the most senior figures in Japanese finance, Esuke Sakakibara, a former deputy finance minister, nicknamed Mr. Yen. Sakakibara emphasized the importance of real growth even in the absence of nominal growth, and pointed out that the Japanese people are wealthy and have prospered personally despite decades of low nominal growth. He made the oft-overlooked point that because of Japan's declining population, real GDP per capita will grow faster than real aggregate GDP. Far from a disaster story, a Japan that has deflation, depopulation, and declining nominal GDP can nevertheless produce robust real per capita GDP growth for its citizens. Combined with the accumulated wealth of the Japanese people, this condition can result in well-to-do society, even in the face of nominal growth that would cause most central bankers to flood the economy with money. Sakakibara is not unaware of the impact of deflation on the real value of debt. The Japanese debt-to-GDP ratio is mitigated by zero interest rates, which prevent the debt from compounding rapidly. Most Japanese government debt is owned by the Japanese themselves, so a foreign financing crisis of the kind that struck Thailand in 1997 and Argentina in 2000 is unlikely. Sakakibara's most telling point is that Japan's growth problems are structural, not cyclical, and therefore cyclical remedies such as money printing will not work. He sees no chance of Japanese inflation hitting the 2% target rate. Sakakibara's insights that monetary remedies will not solve structural problems and that real growth is more important than nominal growth are being ignored by central banks in both the United States and Japan. The Federal Reserve and the Bank of Japan will pursue the money-printing pseudo-remedy as far as possible until investors finally lose confidence in their currencies, their bonds, or both. Japan, the canary, will likely suffer this crisis first. The Federal Reserve's supporters ask, defensively, what else could the Fed have done? If the Fed had not resorted to extraordinary money creation in 2008 and the years since, it does seem likely that asset prices would have plunged further, unemployment would have been significantly higher, and GDP growth significantly worse. A sharp contraction with rising bankruptcies and crashing industrial output, akin to the Depression of 1920, might have resulted. In short, the Fed defenders argue, there really was no choice except to create money on an unprecedented scale. In this view, the problems of executing an exit strategy from monetary expansion are more manageable than the problems of economic depression. Defenders assert that the Fed took the right path in 2008 and persevered with great skill. This is the mainstream view that has resulted in the contemporary lore of Bernanke as hero, a halo that has now been transferred to Janet Yellen. The history of depressions in the United States from 1837 onward supports another perspective on the Fed's actions. Under this view, the Fed should have provided only enough liquidity to mitigate the worst phase of the financial panic in late 2008. Thereafter, the Fed should have capped the amount of excess reserves and normalized interest rates in a range of 1 to 2 percent. Most of the large banks, including Citibank, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman Sachs, should have been temporarily nationalized, their stockholders wiped out, 
and their bondholders subject to principal reductions as needed to restore capital. Non-performing assets could have been stripped from these banks in receivership, then placed in a long-term government trust to be liquidated for the taxpayer's benefit, as circumstances permitted. Management of the banks should have been fired, while enforcement actions and criminal prosecutions were pursued against them as the facts warranted. Finally, asset prices, particularly housing and stocks, should have been allowed to fall to much lower levels than were seen in 2009. In this scenario, bankruptcies and unemployment in 2009 and 2010 would have been much higher and asset values much lower than what actually occurred. The year 2009 would have resembled 1920 in the severity of its depression, with skyrocketing unemployment, collapsing industrial production, and widespread business failure. But an inflection point would have been reached. The government-owned banks could have been taken public with clean balance sheets and would have exhibited a new willingness to lend. Private equity funds would have found productive assets at bargain prices and begun investing. Abundant labor with lower unit labor costs could have been mobilized to expand productivity, and a robust recovery, rather than a lifeless one, would have commenced. The Depression would have been over by 2010, and real growth would have been 4 to 5 percent in 2011 and 2012. The benefit of a severe depression in 2009 is not severity for its own sake. No one wishes to play out a morality tale involving greedy bankers getting their just desserts. The point of a severe depression in 2009 is that it would have prompted the structural adjustments that are needed in the U.S. economy. It would also have diverted assets from parasitic pursuits in banking toward productive uses in technology and manufacturing. It would have moved unit labor costs to a new lower level that would have been globally competitive when higher U.S. productivity was taken into account. Normalized interest rates would have rewarded savers and helped strengthen the dollar, making the United States a magnet for capital flows from around the world. The economy would have been driven by investment and exports rather than relying on the lending and spending consumption paradigm. Growth composition would have more nearly resembled the 1950s when consumption was about 60% of GDP, instead of recent decades when consumption was closer to 70%. These types of healthy, long-term structural adjustments would have been forced on the U.S. economy by a one-time liquidation of the excesses of debt and leverage and the grotesque overexpansion of finance. It is not correct to say the Federal Reserve had no choice in its handling of the economy at the start of the Depression. It is correct to say, in Tom Friedman's phrase, that there was a failure of imagination to see that the economy's problems were structural, not cyclical. The Fed applied obsolete general equilibrium models and took a blinkered view of the structural challenge. Policymakers at the Fed and the Treasury avoided a sharp depression in 2009, but created a milder depression that continues today and will continue indefinitely. Federal Reserve and U.S. Treasury officials and staff said repeatedly in 2009 that they wanted to avoid Japan's mistakes in the 1990s. Instead, they have repeated every one of Japan's mistakes in their failure to pursue needed structural changes in labor markets, eliminate zombie banks, cut taxes, and reduce regulation on the non-financial sector. The United States is Japan on a larger scale. With the same high taxes, low interest rates that penalize savers, labor market rigidities, and too big to fail banks. Abenomics and Federal Reserve money printing share a frenzied focus on avoiding deflation. But the underlying deflation in both Japan and the United States is not anomalous. It is a valid price signal that the system has too much debt and too much wasted investment prior to the crash. Japan is overinvested in infrastructure, just as the United States was overinvested in housing. In both cases, the misallocated capital reached the point where it had to be written off in order to free up bank balance sheets to make new, more productive loans.
But that isn't what happened. Instead, as a result of political corruption and cronyism, regulators in both countries preserve the ailing balance sheets in amber along with banker job security. The deflationary price signals were muted with money printing, the same way pain in athletes is masked with steroids. But the deflation did not go away, and it will never go away until the structural adjustments are made. The United States might find false courage in Japan's apparent success, using its model as ammunition for evaluating its own QE policies, but the signs in Japan are misleading, consisting of more money illusion and new asset bubbles. Japan reached the crossroads first. It opted for Abenomics. The Fed needs to look more critically at Japan's putative escape from depression. If it follows the Japanese path, both nations will be headed for an acute debt crisis. The only difference may be that Japan gets there first. <laughs>